Yeah, that's, uh, that sounds like a risky, a risky <laughs> choice. <laughs> but I'm just saying, like, my point being is that, like, if you don't, if you're trying to be everything to everyone, you'll be no one to no one, you know? Okay, so hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode. So today I'm being joined by someone who I enjoy immensely on Twitter. Uh, she also happens to be the VP of marketing at the world's biggest wedding group, uh, The Knot. Amanda Getz, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. How are you doing? I mean, I'm going to take a wild guess and assume that you wouldn't <laughs> describe your last two months as being particularly normal. No, not at all. Um, I live in New York City, which as most people know is a big hot spot for COVID. And so I'm also a, a single parent of three very young children, six, four, and two. And in New York City, when you live in a building and you're trying to prevent a two-year-old from touching a button, that's basically impossible. So I have been living in Airbnbs for the past three months of my life. I am currently dialed in from Florida in a hundred degree heat, but wow. yeah. So yeah, juggling three kids at home, co-parenting, um, and navigating uh, a business, you know, my day job has been completely, um, uprooted because weddings couldn't happen for a chunk of time. So yeah. All marketing plans kind of went out the window and we had to hurry up and respond while you're managing a team that's in complete, you know, emotional crisis. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it has been not a calm couple of months, but, you know, trying to use it as positive frames as much as possible. Yeah, and we'll definitely come back to that, but it kind of it almost feels like a lifetime's worth of mayhem and chaos thrown into two months in yeah. a way. All while you're trying to emotionally process just the state of the world in general. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. Exactly. So we'll come back to all of that. Um, before we get into the detail, uh, just kind of want to ask uh, our listeners, anyone who's tuned in for the first time, please go and subscribe on Spotify. I know we're at the beginning of the episode and you haven't heard it yet. Um, so that's a big <laughs> ask. But if you do listen to the rest and you enjoy it, please subscribe. If you really, really enjoy it, please go and leave a review and rating on iTunes. So, Amanda, we're going to talk through kind of the chaos, like you said, of kind of your your marketing role and parenting in lockdown. <laughs> we're going to talk a little bit about your personal kind of journey on Twitter this year, because I think that's been, I don't know, I think that's a really interesting story there. Um, and kind of just generally your role at The Knot and how things have changed. You're the guest. Where do you want to start? You choose. Ooh. Um, we can start since we just talked about COVID, we can talk about things at the knot and then start to get more personal. <laughs> yeah, that sounds cool. So, um, how obviously weddings this year, I'm, I'm assuming, am I right in thinking basically like the season's off? Not necessarily. So okay. we're, we're actually seeing new kind of innovation around weddings there was a wedding that just happened in Brooklyn where it was an influencer and she got married on her stoop and closed down the street and had a big street party so people could be far enough away from each other. But then there was like a DJ on the stoop wow. and everybody was dancing. And I actually, it's, it's forced people to even go further on creativity. So we're seeing a lot more micro weddings and still utilizing vendors, um, we saw the rise of the mini money, which is couples who got married like in a very private ceremony, but then they postponed the full celebration to later. Um, so yeah, lots of innovation, but weddings are not going anywhere. People still want to get married based off of you know where they are in life. Some people don't want to pause their life; they wanted to start a family, so they chose to do something now, and then they're having this like big party later in the next year and maybe they'll have a baby at that party who knows but i think it kind of showed that um there's no one way to have a wedding and that that's yeah. kind of our mo anyway at the knot so it was it really cool be, yeah it must be so interesting to observe kind of how people are reacting and creativity and with your marketing i mean how what taught me through that week one right so <laughs> 
you know, I, can't, I don't can't remember quite what the dates were like your part in your part of the world, but here it was almost like you start the week and it's almost normal, and then by the end of the week it's all upside down. Like, what was that week like, and how did you? Yeah. <laughs> what was that process of changing your marketing to a completely different, well, audience? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, it was um, crazy. So like from a personal perspective, I on that Monday had, I froze my eggs. So it was like Monday was I had surgery. And then by Friday, the place like the country was in lockdown. And so this was end of March, middle of March about. Yeah. And so like just my, the juxtaposition of like my week, starting the week with just like having surgery and then all of a sudden being like, oh, I can't leave my home. But from a, from a marketing perspective that we woke up on Thursday with a high sense of uh, certainty that things are gonna get shelter in place. And so within 48 hours, knowing that was gonna happen, we were heading into a weekend and we knew that there were couples that were going to have to postpone their weddings like that, the, weekend. Uh, that weekend immediately. And we like, we could not leave them hanging. We needed to make sure that every FAQ that they could have, we had an answer to. So um, the majority of our team, like we pulled all nighters that night to make sure. So we, we created 24 seven hotlines that they could call and talk to customer service, like people who had the FAQs that could talk them through. What does it mean to postpone my wedding? Who do I call first? What do I do? What's the process to, um, you know, what, how do I look at my contract or whatever it is. And then we also like made sure that we had all of the new articles written that were in line with the CDC and were constantly being updated. So that was within 24 hours, we had the 24 seven hotline going and we pushed that out on social. And then the second part of it was all of the like life cycle marketing. Uh, it was so important to me to make sure that no one on that Saturday woke up with a happy wedding day email because that would be the most insensitive thing in the world, right? So making sure that we rallied all of our email teams and everybody to like put on a lens of just complete empathy to say, if you woke up and your wedding couldn't happen and you just found out yesterday, like what are all the things and touch points that we would have been sending to you that were heightened celebration that needed to turn into complete empathy? That's a, that's a huge task in such a short amount of time, isn't it? Even just the, so that piece of content, the FAQ content, being able to research guidelines that are changing so quickly, understand them and put them into content that quickly is like, that's huge. And then you've got the hotline. And I imagine, you know, like, uh, so we run lots of social ads here and, you know, just making sure that there's nothing inappropriate. Yeah. But we, yesterday was absolutely fine, you know? Right. So there were definitely, we, we created a tier of priority lists of, what we wanted to address immediately because we knew we weren't going to be able to tackle it all. And so luckily with like ads, for example, ads are hitting people who are newly engaged. So mm -hmm. the chances of their wedding happening that weekend were less. So we knew that that could be like the third tier priority of things that we needed to look at. Cause in a time like that, you need to focus on the most immediate, most impactful things first that were going to hit the, the most amount of people. So totally agree. It was a, it was a, a an immense, um, kind of quick case study on prioritization. <laughs> yeah. And how big's your team? So how many people have you got to mobilize? So our entire marketing and editorial departments, uh, around a hundred people. Okay. So there's, I guess on one side, that's great. Cause there's resource available to help on the other side. That's a lot of people to communicate clearly in terms of what's changing and how, how did you manage the communication and prioritization and making sure that nothing got lost in the mix that was really important? It was a lot of meetings, to be honest, where we were all just like headphones in your ears while you were working so that we could all be talking because none of us were in the office and 
it, it, things were moving so quickly. So it was just like, we're going to stay on this hangout all day. Everybody do your job, but we're, this way we can all be talking and sharing the most up-to-date information. And that seemed to work for big chunks of the day. Um, and then someone would be like, I'm signing off for an hour to go like write this thing or to go like make sure that we have the social posts, et cetera. Um, or if like our head of social needed to go powwow with her social team to, to keep them up to date. But it was a lot of keeping the leadership team like in the same room virtually. Um, and then disseminating from there is truly what it was. Amazing. What well, it's kind of, um, it's quite a good stress test on a team, isn't it? Yeah. So it's funny. Our, our team went through uh, the five dysfunctions of a team training not too long ago. And full sight. yeah. And so that whole concept of first team is something that we, we hold pretty near and dear to our hearts of like, your first team isn't your department, meaning like I, marketing is, you would think that you're trying to protect that team all the time, but we really foster a sense of um, the, your kind of counterparts across the organization are your first team. And it, you have to be aligned first and have each other's backs first because that fosters a sense of trust and collaboration below you. Because if, you, if you've ever worked for somebody who, you know, the head of marketing doesn't get along with the head of product or the head of marketing and, you know, head of brand and per performance marketing are always at odds, that creates a lot of triangulation in a company, which is just inefficient. Um, so first team is a big principle for us. And I think that actually helped us prepare for something like this. Cause we knew that we already had that like trust and collaboration. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It's um, so kind of when you're not in a pandemic, <laughs> right? When things, uh, oh, don't, do you remember when things were normal? Um, what's your, what does your marketing mix look like? And what's your kind of, is it, are you on a growth trajectory or are you like, what's the strategy behind it? What's the, what kind of direction you're going in and what does the mix look like to try and kind of make that happen? Yeah. So the way I think about marketing mix is looking at the marketing funnel, right? You have awareness at the very top, then you go into acquisition and then you've got retention and life cycle. At the end, you obviously have like, how do you um, get your cheerleaders, the people that used you all the way through to talk about you so at the top of that funnel awareness your biggest levers are things like pr social most of the time when you think about what your strategy is for like let's say social you want to cast as wide of a net as possible just so your brand is top of mind with weddings you have a very finite addressable audience right only so many people are getting married at a certain amount of time and if you think about it, there's only a smaller subset of those people that are actually doing the thing that you might be marketing at that given time, right? So if I'm planning a wedding that's like a 12 to 14 month process, it's really hard to show me an organic social post that is relevant to me at that specific time. So we utilize like those broader brand channels very differently than we think about performance marketing, SEO, et cetera, because those can actually be served to the right person at the right time. And one thing that I always think about when that middle part of the funnel comes to into play, where we're actually trying to get somebody to take action, we always have the phrase like, right person, right message, right time. No one should be receiving like a generic message, especially when it's, wedding planning and our mission is making sure that you're planning the most personalized wedding to you. Yeah. Um, so that's really important to us. Yeah. Yeah. Th that makes so much sense. And I guess email as well is such a big part. Exactly. And right from the top, when someone first interacts through to you were talking about kind of getting emails out just before someone's wedding and it sounds like you kind of take them on that journey through email as well and yeah that's I think email is often an underrated or under thought about channel sometimes perhaps yeah so email is interesting because I think it's gone on this kind of its own journey right 
everybody was just using the say and spray method of email. It's like, oh, if I just send a full list email, I'm going to like 10%, you know, click through rate. Let's, we'll get a lot of people into the funnel. That works for say like e-com and, and other, you know, direct to consumer sales type things. But if you are a brand, especially if you're trying to target someone planning their wedding, for us, it's always contextualized. And if you ever receive an email that is so heightened, heightenedly um, personalized to you, your, uh, your ability to like want to click on that goes up immensely. And so for wedding planning, it's like, okay, what do we know about them? Oh, we know that they're um, just had their cake tasting. So they're probably more likely to be thinking about this next or they just had their bachelorette party, so now they're thinking about their shower or whatever it is. So we really th think about what their individual journey is and create the different tracks for that. So I totally agree that email is kind of making a comeback, but in a very different way, like push in general, because maximizing both email and SMS can be really powerful too, because you reinforce the message in both channels. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's just, it's so, I find it so interesting how they all play their own role and kind of take on their own purpose, you know, yeah, really, really interesting. So can we talk about Twitter? Sure. Let's talk about Twitter. Um, <laughs> That's how we met. It's how we met, right? So um, you've been on Twitter, you were kind of saying you've kind of been putting an effort for about a year. Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, I joined like, I don't know, seven years ago or something. And then I think I had tweeted three times since. And so I just started actively being on Twitter. And what I, made you decide to have a good kind of crack at it? Well, what kind of made you? Yeah, the, there's a story there. So I was um, having dinner with a friend of mine who is a, a tech founder and he's been in you know the tech space for a while. And I was like, Twitter is an echo chamber. It's a lot of men. I don't feel like there's space for women. Um, and I kind of had these very generalized statements and I was on my soapbox. And so he was like, I think you should try. I'm like, it's not a good use of my time. Like, and, and so whenever I find myself saying that there's not a space for women, that actually is kind of an internal signal to myself that that's my opportunity to change that and, and draw more light on that. So um, I found myself saying that. So then I checked myself and said, okay, let's like actually see if this is true. And if it's true, I need to use my ability or my platform or, you know, just my, um, what I know about building community to change that. So I very intentionally said for six months, I'm going to be active on Twitter and see what happens. And um, I approach Twitter very much like I approach like my everyday life. Like I am an open book. I, if I sit down and I'm, we're grabbing drinks, like you're going to know most of my life story. And hopefully I'm going to know most of your life story by the end of those cocktails, because I just believe in human connection and getting to know somebody. And so I approach Twitter the same way. I'm going to be like, here's what I'm thinking, here's who I am. And what I found was it opened up relationships and connections and it allowed people to share with me I, the amount of DMs I get from women who either have gone through a divorce or infertility or, um, you know, even like freezing their eggs or like they're starting out in marketing. Like, they know that they can come to me because I'm going to have that conversation with them and I will help them in whatever way. And so now I fast forward a year later, like follower count aside, like I don't really care about follower count. What I actually care about is like the actual connections I'm making with people and I'm learning about people. And I didn't realize like how much I was craving community. And now I have this like, you know, this like, niche of marketing Twitter that I know that I can DM or text anybody and be like, what do you think of this idea? Do you have a connection to this brand? And it has been incredible as a resource. So I was proved wrong. Like there is space for lots of voices on Twitter and the TLDR there is just focus on speaking to what's authentic to you 
don't care about like your quantity of people care about the quality of the connections. Yeah. And, Cause yeah. Yeah. Cause we were talking before this, just before we kind of got started about personal branding as a topic. And I, yeah. I don't think you can really, I wouldn't really describe this as personal branding because you're, you're genuinely kind of going out and speaking your mind and talking about things that are really important to you. And, it, and it's not, you know, whereas I think personal branding gets mixed up with, right, I need to go and build an audience and that's my priority, you know. Exactly. And I think when you go go down, that, it's, I find it fascinating because so many people go down that route and just turn into a, a bit of a Gary V. <laughs> yeah, just um, shouting at you all the time. <laughs> yeah. I feel so scared when I watch Gary V videos. I just, <laughs> why are you turning me off? Why are you shouting at me? <laughs> I didn't know I did something wrong. Stop yelling. <laughs> but it, it, it's so easy for people to fall into that trap, I think. Yeah. Um, whereas, yeah, what would you... But yeah, obviously, like, I think, do you think there is a need to have a personal brand when you're working in marketing? I... So, I, I believe that you have to have intention behind everything that you do. Otherwise, you're never going to get anywhere. So I'm a big believer in like defining what success looks like for you and why you're doing something. So I was specifically set out on Twitter to see if I could find people like me or, you know, connect with people on a deeper level. Um, with personal branding, like I get the question a lot, like, oh, do you schedule your tweets? And I'm like, no, like literally what I'm tweeting is the thing that is in my mind at that moment and I'm pushing it out. And if, so if you are a startup founder and you're like actually trying to build a brand around a specific topic and you're writing content, like I'm not, I, I, I have three kids. I don't have time to write medium blogs. Like I just don't. And, but if you actually are, doing thought leadership and, and like building out your content series, then yes, that's like building a personal brand. You're, you're, you're choosing topics. You're being very thoughtful and strategic. Um, yeah, I'm definitely not putting that much time and effort. It is truly like everything that I'm experiencing, like with my team, what, um, what I'm seeing, it's like, you know, state of the world right now, like, we need to be talking to like our team members who are people of color. Like we need to be having very real conversations to make sure that we're supporting them. Like all of these things yeah. that are very real. For sure. Like to me, that's important to share what I'm doing as like a boss. So other people can like have that conversation or be like, Oh yeah, I hadn't thought about that. I should do that. Um, yeah. It's quite refreshing to hear respect for the platform as have you, you've now got a voice. And I think, do you think there's, um, there's like a little bit of responsibility with that, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I didn't realize until a few weeks ago when I started seeing my tweets on companies, emails or in other people's like Instagrams that had like massive followings. Like someone sent me one of my tweets that was on, um, an Instagram post that went out to 500,000 people. And I realized that I'm not just speaking to like a couple hundred people anymore. So yes, I do um, take that a little bit more seriously, but it doesn't change the types of things I'm going to say, like that are just authentic to me and things that I'm thinking about. Um, I think it's interesting because a conversation I've had with a couple of other marketing folks is what's the balance between talking about how you're approaching marketing because your brand, like you represent a brand. And so I'm very cautious about not saying like, at the knot, we are doing X, Y, and Z strategy here, yep. everybody, please know that. Yeah. Um, so I definitely think about zooming up to a 30,000 foot view of understanding like, oh, I had a very interesting conversation about how to balance um, SEO content versus thought leadership content, right? Meaning somebody is searching for this, versus we want to push this out because it aligns with our brand values. Okay. Had that cool conversation. I'm not going to say specifically like what keyword research and what we're doing or how we're balancing that, but I'll say like, oh, the balance between SEO and, and thought leadership 
is something we should be talking about. How do we, how do I spark a conversation around that? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's all like really, I don't know. It's, I just think it's really interesting stuff. And I, obviously I have to pull out an example here. Oh gosh. So, <laughs> I like this one. So yesterday you tweeted, uh, marketers, when building a go-to-market strategy, do you focus on brand? who you are or target a customer who they are first which i thought was like a marketing version of would you rather (laughs) one of my favorite games it was a little facetious because it's a chicken and the egg conversation but i was genuinely curious i was giving a talk last night about go-to-market strategy and as i was preparing my thoughts that question i was like i'm curious what people say and then all of a sudden there's like a hundred (laughs) comments like it, uh, are you a would you rather fan oh my gosh i love that game uh, all right so after <laughs> we should do that uh, yeah after this so i should probably follow up with a very professional courteous message to say thank you for your time but instead <laughs> I'm, we're just I'm gonna, gonna go straight to like, would you rather game. A random options that you're gonna have to choose one from okay i'm so game so um anyway back to the uh, marketing would you rather i just i, th- I started thinking about it so like, well course you focus on the audience first because to me the reason a business exists is to serve an audience or there's a need or there's there's a gap somewhere Mm -hmm. right but then as a brand what makes you different is your personality and you know what you believe in or how you see the world so (laughs) what do you have an answer to this question (laughs) So I actually always start with where you see yourself playing in the competitive landscape. So I do start with a little bit of brand mission because I think that without any semblance of who you are and what you stand for, you're a little bit of a plastic bag blowing in the wind of whatever users you think um, or you hear from. But I think it's, it's, you got a little bit of this and a little bit of this, and then you iterate together. Yep. But if I had to choose one of where to start, I always start with just, okay, who am I in this world? Like, who am I wanting to, how am I different than all of my competitors, kind of competitive set? Then you start to say, and who, does that resonate with this type of user, this type of user, or this type of user? And you're going to evolve just like we as humans evolve, like who I am 20 at 20 is so different than who I am at 34. And because of like what I've learned and the people I've interacted with and the same goes for a brand, like who the knot was 20 years ago is very different than who the knot is today because the, like our, the couples are changing, like everything is changing. Right. So yeah, I think that you, you, for me, but it was funny because the majority of people said customers. It's, yeah, it was a really interesting one, and but it's definitely an iterative process, isn't it? Like you, absolutely, it, they both have to go in parallel. Otherwise, mm-hmm. you're going to have no personality, or you're not going to be answering anything. Absolutely, you can't be everything to everyone. Like yeah. the the most boring social channels are the ones who try to do that, and they don't stand for anything, and they have no idea who their actual community is. Yeah. Like yeah, people, not, not the, the best thing about Twitter for me is like, people are always like, oh, like, do you get all these like reply guys and, you know, Twitter DMs and all that stuff. And I'm like, honestly, no, because if you actually follow me, you know that I'm speaking about like, um, you know, being a feminist and, and like gender equality and all of these things. And so there's not many guys that are willing to like slide into my DMs. <laughs> yeah that's uh that sounds like a risky a risky <laughs> choice <laughs> but i'm just saying like my point being is that like if you don't if you're trying to be everything to everyone you'll be no one to no one you know yeah that's such a great point um so all really like useful pieces of advice there like it's it's so interesting hearing about it all um the other topic we were going to talk about was how you found you know, working in a demanding, busy role, being really active on social, but also homeschooling, you know, managing three kids around the house. Um, Yeah, it sounds sounds so crazy. Um, Like, I don't know any different. I, I, it's like, I don't know if you've ever heard the saying, like, I don't know who discovered water, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't a fish. 
I don't know any different. Like this is my normal. But when you zoom out and somebody else says it, I'm like, yeah, that sounds crazy. Like how, how does someone do that? But this is my normal. So um, I am very intentional about everything that I, I do. Um, and if you talk to my team, like I don't respond to emails that are not necessary to respond to. Like I, unless you really need me, I believe somebody can, everybody texts me. They know how to get a hold of me when they truly need me. Um, and then honestly, it's about setting really clear boundaries and removing guilt. Like for me, guilt can seep into everything that I do because I could always be doing something else. And so I have been very clear about setting boundaries, both like for the people around me, but also for myself to know that uh, if it's Sunday afternoon and I have been with the kids all morning and I need to literally just sit on the couch and do nothing, I'm going to say, okay, Amanda, for the next three hours, you get to chill. Like you're not going to touch your phone. You're not going to touch your computer. And this is your time to recharge. And I, that way for three hours, I don't feel guilty that I am not doing eight other things that I could be doing. So um, it's crazy. I'm not going to lie. I'm, 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 I don't want to like, sweep this under the rug and be like, yeah, it's great. Like I cannot get over the fact that I think you, we were talking before and you're like, can you believe that? Like if somebody would have said this to you in January that you'd be like home with your three kids, uh, I, I would have been like, where's my passport? Like, I love you children, but goodbye. Like yeah. what the heck? But when you're thrown in and you don't have a choice, you don't have a choice. And um, yeah, it's yeah. like, I'm very, very thankful. I mean, as somebody who does, you know, have to co-parent, this is the most time I have ever gotten with my kids because yeah. of our co-parenting relationship. So I am extremely thankful, but also like it is not sustainable. Like I keep watching all these headlines and people who don't have kids being like, the future of work is here. Like remote work is amazing. Like this is great. And I'm like, that. If we don't figure out childcare and how to get yeah. either antibody tests to my like nanny or um, unlocking a new type of childcare workforce, this is not going to be sustainable. In the fall, we're going to be back to like half productivity because we're going to be back in the same situation. When you have kids, our age, our kids' ages, like they can't click on Zoom links by themselves. They don't know how to unmute themselves. Like you have to sit next to them and help them with everything. Yeah. Oh yeah. Big time. It's, um, well, I think one of the positives is when you're thrown in, it really forces you to look at your day <clears throat> mm -hmm. and you know, you have your, your, your productive time is shrunk and you have to make the most of it. And it's like you were saying, like, you don't have the time to respond to things that you don't have to respond to. You don't yeah. have the time to be in meetings that you don't need to be in. So it is a really, like my working routine has changed beyond recognition. How so? And just kind of, you know, so morning is my time. I get my head down, I do my work, and then mm -hmm. I go, you know, spend the afternoon trying, I mean, trying to help out the kids <laughs> a little bit and, you know, have a bit more of a relaxed afternoon. We go out for a bike ride, all that type of stuff. And then if mm -hmm. I have to catch up and catch up in the evening. But, you know, before you'd be like, no, nah, I can't do that. Like I've got to be on it, on it, on it. And you're yeah. like, it is really, it has been really interesting. Um, also some very funny moments, I think, because as yeah. tiring and exhausting as it is having young kids around the house, yeah. it is, have you got any funny stories from it? Like what, have you, any highlights from the um, chaos, madness? I mean, I guess, so two stories. One actually just happened the other day. I was on like, as a marketer, Ad Week is obviously like you, you want to be on Ad Week, you want to talk to Ad Week. And I was so stoked I was doing Ad Week Live. And Amazon decided to come right as I'm going live. And no one was in the house at the time. And they rang the doorbell twice. So I'm like, I can't let them keep ringing the doorbell. So I literally had to get up and answer the door while talking to a large group of people. So that's one. Um, two. <laughs> Was it worthwhile? Was it like a decent Amazon package? 
It was coffee. So yes, I, I mean, I can't live without coffee. And it was funny because everybody was like um, on the ad week chat being like, what'd she get? What'd she get? And I was like, I wish this could be cooler than coffee. Like, gosh, I look so boring. But um, the second one, I was giving a big presentation and my child, you could hear her in the background asking me to come wipe her because she had just gone to the bathroom. Oh, and I was like, okay, this is happening. And everybody was laughing. Luckily, they didn't have to see it. I could go on. But, <laughs> you know, kids, they can't, like, when they need you to wipe them, they're going to keep screaming for you until you go. So You can't escape that situation. You can't. No, no. That's, that's real life. But like these, I think my highlight, probably, the thing that sums it up was um, I was on a big kind of client call the other week, or we were about to go on and then, uh, one of our account managers who was presenting his bit had a power cut two minutes before the call. And he texted me, so I've got 1% battery. My power's not in the house. Oh, gosh. Right, right. Okay. <laughs> I know enough about this. I can kind of go on and do the call. But you know when you're presenting someone else's slides, even if you know the topic, it's pretty difficult. Right? Yeah. So I'm like, right, okay, I'm getting into it. I'm, we're doing okay here. Then the door opens and the kids come in and you know when they're, you know when they're like properly in ambush mode. Yes. Like they've got this look on the face, which is just saying like, they're like you're not going to get anything done right now. We're coming for you. <laughs> and like, that was it. But just, you think like three months ago, that would have been a professional, like oh, taboo. Yeah. Like, whoa. Whereas now it's just quite funny. Yeah. I actually, that's, that's the best part of this whole thing is that we no longer have to pretend like we don't have a life outside of work. Yeah. Like, um, my boyfriend walked behind me while I was on like a, a conference call and all, all the people were like, Oh, let's say hi. And so, you know, everybody's saying hi. And then like somebody's showing off their dog and, and it yeah. just is like, I feel like we're, acting more just like humans than we than robots which is just awesome yeah there's definitely i think there are definitely definitely positives that have come through all of this for yeah. sure that is definitely one of the biggest ones so look i mean thank you so much for making the time yeah. um just to kind of wrap up uh, i'm sure the answer to this question is going to be twitter but where can people find you <laughs> yes twitter. twitter yeah uh love to connect with people on twitter so hit me up Okay, perfect. Excellent. And we'll, we'll obviously put your uh, handle in the show notes with this. Awesome. Thanks for making the time. Yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate it.